morning everyone and uh, welcome uh, to today's webinar which is going to be uh, a very very uh, welcome collaboration with the uh, Community Plant Variety Office and uh, the COPORA organization. It's a pleasure again uh, for the European IP Help Desk uh, to welcome you and uh, to be able to spend another couple of hours uh, together in the morning talking about uh, intellectual property, intellectual uh, property rights. Uh, in uh, this uh, very uh, particular and uh, interesting uh, field of plant variety protection, we are going to cover a very specific topic like we normally uh, do with the colleagues of the CPVO and we're going today to talk about constraints and opportunities um, for um, edited varieties. Is GMO legal framework impacting the creation of new plants? Um, so we're going to see <clears throat> uh, uh, today um, this uh, very interesting and uh, we're going to find an answer to this uh, very uh, peculiar and interesting question in uh, uh, collaboration with uh, our two illustrious uh, speakers who are uh, today Montserrat Garcia Monco Fuente uh, and uh, Ceci uh, Colonier from uh, uh, the CPVO. Uh, the Community Plant Variety Office of the European Union. It's a pleasure for us uh, to be able to host you today and to be able to listen to you, to both of you. Cecilia Montserrat, thank you very much for uh, joining uh, the, um, the webinar. Of course, what I really want to do is simply give you the word and let you share information together with us, but you and participants must excuse me for a couple of minutes because as we usually do. Uh, it's uh, also one of my tasks and duties to introduce the services of the European IP Help Desk and you should be able uh, to see my slides uh, now. This is just uh, to tell to those of you who perhaps are the first time uh, together with us uh, what the European IP Help Desk is and what we do uh, for the community and also for the individual uh, physical and juridical persons. We are a service initiative of the European Commission and our objective is um, currently to address uh, potential beneficiaries of EU-funded projects, researchers and small and medium enterprises across the European Union mainly uh, to uh, understand and use intellectual property and intellectual property rights. I said mainly because those three target groups are certainly most important target groups that uh, we have uh, for our services but not the only one we're not limited uh, to helping uh, those particular ca uh, categories in fact the services that you can see on the right hand side of the screen are actually open uh, to all physical and juridical persons so practically to anyone who is uh, interested in IP uh, and IPR and would like uh, to know more how can people then no more regarding IP and IPR? Well, they can do it through uh, our website mainly, which you can see on the right-hand side of the screen. That's cc.europa.eu slash IP minus helpdesk. And from the website, you can have access to the different services that are there uh, for your use. And they are completely free of charge, like publications that you can download uh, completely for free uh, and training activities like for example, uh, today with our regular webinars, and we very much hope that we're going to be able to organize uh, on-site uh, trainings once again, once the pandemic um, time is finally up. But let's see when that is going to happen. Also, we have a network of ambassadors across the European Union. And these ambassadors uh, are there uh, to get in touch directly with the economical and uh, societal tissue of uh, the European Union, of the companies and researchers which are uh, displaced, so to say, around uh, the EU. And uh, I'm going to introduce them uh, very um, quickly. Um, I was told I have a couple of problems with the uh, slides you should be able now to see uh, the clouds of the european ip help list. and then yes so that's that's fine um we also have um 
a cooperation with uh, uh, different um, uh, siblings, so to say, across the world. And the services I have introduced now are uh, for uh, the sole European Union uh, and with the addition of some uh, Horizon related countries like uh, Turkey, <laughs> uh, Norway, uh, Switzerland and so on. Uh, but if you are interested in these services and you need to know, for example, patent information about uh, patent registration in China, in India, in Southeast Asia, Africa or Latin America, you can simply ask to our uh, other SME, IP SME help desk that are there to help you with that particular geographical area with specific question about intellectual property and IP rights. So I talked to you about the website, the training, uh, the publications available. Uh, I'd like to add that um, uh, audiovisual content is available on YouTube as well. And our uh, speakers are introducing the uh, topics that they cover throughout uh, their webinars. Uh, and uh, also uh, the animated videos introduce the most important topics of intellectual property and intellectual property rights. Again, just like all the other services and the helpline as well uh, are uh, completely free of charge. I'd like to say one word regarding the helpline because it's a very interesting tool that can help you uh, finding the answer to your questions. Uh, directly uh, answered by experts who are sitting in Alicante. You can write down your question and send it to them. I will leave you uh, the account later on at the end of the slide uh, so that you can address your questions directly uh, to our, our uh, experts and they can answer them to you. Then we have uh, also one social media uh, account on Twitter and one on LinkedIn uh, that you can contact in case you would like to get in touch once again with us. I told you there are publications. This is our newborn about Green Deal uh, published in February 2022. Uh, the next bulletin is going to be published in June, July, probably. And uh, you can download it, it's free of charge, and it's about uh, the new Green Deal policies of the European Union connected to intellectual property rights. We have an ambassador scheme, as I told you, perhaps some of the ambassadors you can find online on our website are very near to your location. So uh, check out where they are and who they are and how they could perhaps uh, possibly help you. They are very, very interesting professional uh, uh, features because uh, they mix the knowledge of intellectual property rights with the opportunities of the Enterprise Europe network uh, activities. So they can help really uh, commercialize and uh, make use of intellectual property and intellectual property rights because of their uh, very um, um, interesting and peculiar professional knowledge and position. And then, uh, since we are uh, today in one of uh, the training and workshop in collaboration with the Community Plant Variety uh, Office and uh, CIOPORA, I'd like uh, to provide you with a small overview of uh, our collaboration that is going on also uh, for 2022 and which we are very happy uh, to bring forward, but it's actually a, a longer uh, collaboration started uh, two years uh, ago that has brought us analyzing a, a few uh, thematics uh, together and also collecting now a quite interesting uh, library of recordings uh, that we have uh, uh, drawn <coughs> and uh, um, um, uh, so to say signed uh, together. And uh, if, you, if you are interested in one of the upcoming webinars, please do not hesitate um, um, to register uh, to them. And uh, also, if you have missed one of the uh, previous webinars uh, regarding the collaboration with the Community Plant Variety Office in Siopora, uh, just uh, do not hesitate to request to have access uh, to uh, the link uh, that will allow you to check out the video and see the video online, uh, we will uh, be very happy to provide you with a possibility to watch uh, the um, uh, webinar uh, once again. Or, if, of course, for the upcoming webinars, you are very, very welcome uh, to register uh, and take part to our next appointments. Oops, and should, excuse me.
Uh, also, beside, of course, our collaboration with uh, these uh, two uh, institutions, which is mainly concentrating and focusing on uh, uh, plant varieties uh, uh, and uh, growers' uh, activities. Uh, we also have a regular webinar, so I left uh, a couple of uh, upcoming appointments for the first half of the year. You're very happy to join, and um, we would be very happy uh, to join uh, if you joined uh, one of these uh, uh, dates, uh, one of these webinars, and um, we're going to be there. Uh, of course, uh, at any appointment, uh, hosting you and welcoming you and trying to make sure that everything is uh, working in the best possible way to share information and share contacts as well. And finally, I left a couple of learning opportunities written down to these uh, slides. If you'd like to, to know more about IP and IPR, you've got the learning portals of the WIPO and of the uh, EPO as well as the uh, WIPO. Uh, if you'd like to be followed and, and assisted by uh, experts in one of intellectual property fields, you've got very interesting um, 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 initiatives like IPA for SMEs or the uh, SME Fund uh, or also uh, the results booster and the horizon IP scan. Um, depending on what you would like to do and what you need, uh, here I have left some very interesting um, links that can be very gladly used for your activities and uh, they are all as well, just like the European IP help desk free of charge. So I left a couple of uh, contacts in here. The website, as I told you, is a cornerstone of all the services, but I've also left for you uh, the helpline account in case you'd like to ask questions regarding intellectual property and intellectual property rights to our experts, or also the training account in case, for example, you'd like to retrieve already past webinar uh, and you'd like to see it once again or receive the slides. We would be very happy if you would write uh, to one of these accounts and we would answer to you within three working days. Having said that, I'd like only to mention that today's presentation is recorded, So, uh, but we're going to do that only for your advantage so that you can uh, be actually provided afterwards with uh, uh, the, um, uh, the information uh, of uh, the uh, webinar and uh, you're going to receive a follow-up email uh, this afternoon containing the um, um, uh, recording I think as well as the PDF file uh, of the slides uh, all together from me from Montserrat and from Cecil. Um, finally uh, you might have noticed that you have been muted um, that's only because we're going we are growing in numbers that means that uh, it would be hard for us then to ensure that there are no background noises but that does not mean you're not allowed to ask questions you're very welcome to do so and you can do it at any moment simply by writing down your question on the uh, question part of your screen and I'm going to gather all these questions and we're going to go through a dedicated question and answer part at the end of this webinar and um, mm, uh, our experts are then going to provide you a couple of answers. I think I have taken away enough of um, your time, so without any further ado, I would leave the words to my colleague Montserrat uh, Garcia Moncofuente. Thank you very, very much once again, Montserrat, for being with us. I am giving you the role of uh, a relator, and uh, you can now share your screen if you'd like to and uh, your screen sharing button is directly underneath uh, the green camera you can so uh, thank you very much michele um and and welcome everybody to this uh, to this session on gmos uh, of course thanks as well to the european ip help desk for organizing it uh, I think that the first thing that I would like to do is to introduce ourselves. So first, I would like to introduce my colleague, uh, Mrs. Cécile Colonier, who is a technical expert at the CPVO. She is an expert on VIO molecular techniques and has a strong experience in, in GMOs, risk assessment and, plan, and gene editing. Sorry. As regards myself, I am, uh, well, Monsignor Tiamonco, I am the head of the legal service. 
So today's presentation uh, will follow the following scheme. So I will make a short introduction to the topics that afterwards Mrs. Colonier will, will develop in her presentation. And as you said, there will be enough time for, for questions at the end. Uh, but before getting into the introduction, I think that it might be useful as well to give some uh, some 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 information about the CPVO because I don't know if everybody is, is aware of what, who we are, what we do. So the CPVO, the Community Plan Variety Office, is an agency of the European Union who is in charge of uh, putting in place uh, the system of protection of community plan variety rights. We are uh, doing this since 1995, and we are currently located in Angers, in France. Uh, and what we do is that we grant an IP right to, to plant varieties that fulfill certain criteria, which are mainly that they are, are distinct, uniform, stable. Those are the technical criteria. And then also they have to be new and have a, an appropriate uh, variety denomination. So based on this, if they, if they if fulfill this criteria after a technical examination, uh, the, the right is granted and there is a, the right has a duration normally of 25 years, but in certain species, the right is extended to 30 years. But this was just to give an overview to, to our system and, and what the, the office does. Uh, but I think it's it's enough. So now I would like to just start the introduction to also not to take too much time from, from my colleague's presentation. So, well, uh, the aim of today's presentation is basically to provide clarity, at least as much as it can be provided, on the legal framework for gene editing in the European Union. So here you will see, of course, we have the, the legislation in force, which covers many directives and, and regulations. But further to that, reference will also be made today to a very crucial this ruling from the Court of Justice from 2018, which is in fact uh, called as the mutagenesis uh, ruling. In said ruling, the court took the view that uh, organisms obtained by new mutagenic, mutagenesis uh, techniques are GMOs and fall within the scope of the GMO directive. Said ruling was in fact a game-changing regulatory, had a game-changing regulatory impact on the EU plan reading scenario, and indeed was the reason behind the EU request from the European Council to the Commission to prepare a study on new genomic techniques in light of this ruling. So, uh, in fact, the core, the Council, sorry, recognized that even if the core had clarified the scope of the GMO legislation, as regards to mutagenesis techniques, it also raised practical questions with consequences not only for the member states, national competent authorities, but also for the EU industry, in particular the plant breeding sector, research and beyond. So the study was published very recently, on 29th April 2021, so last year. And what is interesting from this study is that further to clarifying or concluding that the GMOs legislation in force apply to uh, organisms produced by new genomic techniques uh, and with saying that they are GMOs and they must fulfill the obligations of the EU GMOs legislation. It also states that new genomic techniques have potential benefits as they can contribute to the objectives of the farm to form strategy which is one of the key actions of the commissions under the European Green Deal, European Green Deal, and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals for a more resilient and sustainable agri-food sector. So, as you might know, Farm to Fork intends to shift the current EU food system to a more sustainable one, and, and among the goals that it, it is include, that they are included in this strategy, there is to ensure sufficient, affordable and nutritious food within planetary limits and also to halt the use of pesticides and fertilizers. So, according with the study from the Commission and in line with said objectives, new genomic techniques can make plant resistance to pests and diseases, needing less chemicals, pesticides or resistant to the effects of climate change, New genomic techniques can also improve the nutritious, nutritious content of food and also uh, reduce the content of harmful, harmful substances 
such as toxins or allergens. Of course, this study, this study has also revealed what well, they were known, but it has also highlighted uh, criticism and divergent opinions on the benefits of using new genomic techniques, highlighting the risks with, for the environment and for the public health. Uh, well, indeed, there is there is a, an intense political debate around the use of GMOs at EU level, but also at national level. And here, uh, Mrs. Uh, Colonier's presentation will focus on the, exam on the case of France, which is quite interesting. Uh, but in any case, this is a debate that goes around the whole European Union and, and on the whole, the, all the member states. But um, what we can extract from this debate and also from the study is uh, certain, certain points that I would like to highlight. First, that there is a general suspect towards GMOs. Probably there is a, a need to educate uh, consumers, but also policymakers. Uh, there is also the issue of competitiveness, as uh, the lengthy and very expensive uh, procedures for release of GM products that, as Mrs. Colonia will now explain in a few minutes, uh, do not allow that European Union to compete uh, with comparable countries where such uh, restrictions do not exist. Another point to keep in mind is the fact that uh, there is no difference in the results. So, uh, normally, it is not possible to uh, identify products obtained by random mutagenesis or by in directed mutagenesis. And what probably is the biggest paradox is that changes introduced by mutagenesis, mutagenesis are more drastic than the results of gene editing because they target specific traits and are more precise. So, in any case, uh, that's the debate. The Commission is working and the Commission is following the continuous progress in modern biotechnology to consider how the European Union can benefit from innovation on one side in food and agriculture sector while maintaining at the same time high levels, high safety standards. So, uh, so that's, uh, that's more or less uh, the debate. But I think that now it's time that I leave the floor to Mrs. Colonier so that he can, she can uh, going deep into this this issue, so so thank you for your attention and please, Cecil, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monte. Very nice introduction. Um, I don't show. Sure. I'm gonna try to show my screen. I don't know if you see something. Yes, Cecil, yeah. we can see your uh, okay. slide but you could perhaps make them a full screen so we're going to see them better mm -hmm. okay so uh, it is in full screen here uh, i'm gonna have the usual problem um, mm -hmm. uh, you, you can also press f5 if you have a mm -hmm. uh, okay. windows computer mm -hmm. uh, do you see it? Or oh, maybe uh, that's what I should do. I have two screens. I'm going to turn. Wow. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> <That's better. laughs> okay. And this I can close for now because I think it's going to be in your way. No. So I have to put it somewhere where it's not visible. Okay. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for the invitation and thank you for Monse for introducing the very largely and precisely the, the, um, the topic. Uh, so I'm the speaker today, but of course the presentation was prepared with uh, the legal service of CPVO and especially Monse and also Ursula that you know uh, well if you attended other webinars. Um, so I'm going to um, talk about the constraints and opportunities for edited varieties and more specifically try to answer to the question, is the GMO legal framework impacting the creation of new plant varieties? So uh, we're going to go through different uh, parts in the presentation. The first one will be just a reminder of the legal framework uh, for GMO in the EU. And then I'm going to uh, present to you the, the, um, these new genome, genome editing techniques and their particularities and why they uh, trigger some new questions. 
and also illustrate in the third part how they are start to be used in plant innovation and how it is important that the legal framework is adapted uh, to these new developments to, to not refrain innovation. Um, and uh, then we're going to talk more specifically about the legal current status of these uh, genetic te techniques and how it is debated uh, in, in Europe and uh, what can be done to develop a future-proof legal framework for, for, for the European Union. So first of all, the uh, reminder of the legal framework uh, for GMOs. So um, the, the, the legal framework in the EU relies on diverse texts that are all presented here. So the, the three main uh, ones are the ones on the left. Uh, you know them well, I suppose. The Directive 2001-18 on the release in the environment uh, of GMOs. And then the two uh, regulations, 1829 and uh, 1830 from 2003 on um, the release of uh, food and feed, GM food and feed, and on trustability and labeling of these GM uh, food and feed products and GMOs has, has been. Uh, then you have additional texts um, that are more um, directed as uh, specific issues, so like the regulation 1946-2003 for the transboundary movements of GMOs. Uh, then a text, a directive um, um, dedicated to uh, GM microorganisms, 2009-41, and then um, uh, a directive uh, uh, amending the 2018, that is the 2015 412, uh, to allow member states to restrict or prohibit the cultivation of GMOs in their territory. And to that is added also the regulation on transparency uh, uh, in the EU about risk assessment in the food chain. So with this legal framework, there are different uh, procedures that uh, are applied to assess the GMOs before they're released on the market. And so uh, these assessments have four objectives to um, protect human and animal health, to protect the environment. Uh, they also define harmonized procedures for the risk assessment uh, itself. And of course, they uh, um, is, are supposed to provide means of ensuring a clear labeling and the traceability of the genes. So just to explain to you uh, the procedure uh, of risk assessment that is uh, coordinated by EFSA for, for GMO uh, applications, uh, and to illustrate how heavy it is and, and uh, what impact it can have on, on companies, on breeding companies, when they enter into these procedures. So the first thing is uh, to prepare uh, your application, your regulatory dossier, and to send uh, a notification to one member state. You have to go inside the procedure through a national door then uh, the, this member state will be um, get in capacity to uh, assess the risk and give authorizations for what we call the part A and the part B of the procedure, part A being for the confined use of GMOs and part B for uh, an environment release, but only for R&D purposes, meaning all the trials, including the trials that CPVO uh, uh, set up for, for the protection of varieties. And uh, so for uh, the authorization to market the GMO, so the part C of the procedure, then there's an implication of all the member states and EFSA takes the lead. So the member state transfer the, the, the file um, to the EFSA office. And uh, then there's a validation, of course, that the, the, the dossier is complete. And uh, we enter a six month period of risk assessment. This, this clock can be stopped uh, anytime there is a need for an additional document or additional information. So that can extend the deadline really by force, sometimes several years, but one. Um, so during this uh, procedure of risk assessment that I'm gonna describe, there is a consultation of the member states. They have three months to comment the, the file. And these comments will be taken into account when EFSA will prepare his final overall opinion. So the way the risk assessment is, is done um, uh, involves three work groups inside EFSA, one work group for uh, molecular aspects, 
Another work group uh, focused on uh, the, um, the sanitary and toxicity issues of food and feed, and another, a third group on the environment, the impact on the environment. So these uh, three groups of experts will prepare uh, conclusions that will then be validated in the framework of the GMO panel. There will be an opinion that will be transferred to the, the Office of EFSA. In addition to that, uh, there is a delegation of the evaluation on site for uh, files that are uh, the request a cultivation of the GMO. So when you go into the field, when it's for uh, to, to cultivate the GM event, there's a member state, uh, usually the one that received the notification, that will uh, go through the evaluation of uh, the so the environmental risk assessment era. I, I, I added the translation here. Uh, the environmental risk assessment. Uh, for the cultivation dossiers is done by a member state. So all uh, this information is gathered and also in parallel there is in, in the regulation the, the obligation to provide a detection method for any new GM event and this uh, detection method has to be validated by the Joint Research Center, more specifically the lab that is dedicated to that that is mentioned here. So EFSA has to make sure that the validation is also going on and is ready uh, at the end of the risk assessment period. They prepare um, their, their opinion and they're going to publish it. So it takes an, an additional three, four weeks. And from this, the start of this publication, then there's a one month public consultation. So based on, the, uh, on the, the, the opinion of the public and on the opinion of EFSA, then the commission has three months to draft a decision and then to uh, discuss it and take a, uh, uh, the decision to authorize or to reject. And the uh, decision is published in the official journal of, of the European Union. So for when you go through all this procedure, application assessment, member said can express themselves, they can opt out, and uh, you got uh, an authorization of release, uh, then you are registered, uh, the EFSA has, has a registry uh, where uh, your, your event is listed and you are authorized to uh, put it on the market for 10 years. So when you have an authorization for cultivation, you get it for, for 10 years based on the conclusion of the member state that did the, the assessment of the era. But you um, have to add to that uh, the obligation to prepare and to include into your uh, regulatory dossier what we call a PMEM plan, which means post-market environmental monitoring. So it has to be prepared by the applicant and um, it's, uh, it's a part of the file. And uh, in, when the authorization is, is given, during this, the 10 years of authorization, you have uh, an annual review of this plan uh, that is prepared by the, by the breeder, um, by the, the by EFSA and by the, the member states so when they're consulted. So it, it's, it adds to the cost uh, of, of uh, putting on the market in the EU a, a GM event. So um, after the 10 years, you have the possibility also to renew the application and then uh, the, the, the evaluation, the risk assessment will be uh, reduced and will mainly be uh, done based on the 10-year the report uh, uh, of the, the previous use of, of the GM event. And you have, you can get so a prolongation uh, for the cultivation or importation of, of your GM event. So all of that is very time consuming and costly for everybody. Uh, for example, for a GM plant, it can currently take up to six years and several million euros to generate the data that is necessary for the preparation of the regulatory dossier. And that has, has a consequence for certain crops that it overpasses the expected return on breeding investment. And so basically, it's not worth it. Uh, you, can, you will not make money, you will spend it in uh, administrative uh, uh, actions and, and, and uh, the preparation of the regulatory dossier. So finding the appropriate level of regulatory oversight is of great importance for plant innovation. The particularity of our uh, regulation on GMO, and you all know it basically, is that it is a process-based approach. And that is at, at the heart of the problem we have now, uh, because 
the breeding techniques have been listed in the original directive 2001-18 with some techniques that are out of the scope and some techniques that are in the scope but at the time of course they didn't know about gene editing so the problem now is to position uh, these methodologies and for now as once I explained to you uh, we are in the scope but that could change for certain applications I'm going to explain it now so just to remind you in uh, outside the scope you have technologies that are concerned considered as uh, not resulting in genetic modification and uh, you have also technologies that are resulting in genetic modification but that are excluded if there is no recombinant DNA used and that is mutagenesis and protoplast fusion and so for until now mutagenesis until the decision of the, the, the court of justice it was pretty clear that uh, all the uh, techniques of uh, classical mutagenesis uh, didn't need any uh, risk assessment for the, the products uh, uh, produced. In the scope, you have the classical transgenesis, fusion of transformed protoplast, and different types of injections of uh, free DNA molecules inside the, the plant, so micro, macro injection, and micro encapsulation of free DNA molecules. But of course, this list was not exhaustive, so um, that's why we're, yeah, we're discussing that. So. Uh, genome editing techniques now. A little presentation. So why are we discussing uh, genome editing techniques now? Uh, it's because it would be interesting for, for plant breeding to have a regulation that is a little more uh, supple, but also because the regulation uh, imposes to have a detection method that is specific to the GM event. And in classical transgenesis, that's what is uh, represented here, you had that because the transgene was always introduced into the genome randomly. And random means that it is a unique event, um, basically. And so thanks to that, uh, the place where the transgene was, was the signature of the, the GM event. And so you could develop molecular methods to detect the place of insertion of the transgene, and then you would you were in capacity to say, okay, I recognize exactly in this product there is this particular GM event. So, uh, in addition to to, to uh, that, for classical transgenesis, when the transgene uh, was inserted, it could be all clean with just a single copy insertion, but many uh, different types of insertions could occur multiple insertions meaning the transgene is inserted several times in the genome the transgenes could be in, introduced by modified because of the process of the transformation and it could also modify the site of insertion so uh, a genomic region where he just uh, landed and and created some disturbance in the expression of the genes around so with classical transgenesis, it is necessary to screen a lot of individuals when you regenerate, huh? when you when you uh, have your final plants, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, to find uh, plants that really have a single copy of the transgene inserted correctly, uh, expressing itself correctly. So all these different uh, situations uh, created the ID at, at the time uh, of, of the writing of the, the, the current regulation that uh, this uh, disruption of the genome uh, could have an effect on the physiology of the plant, of course, and also uh, as a consequence, the, the GM trait could have an impact on the environment and also when uh, uh, eaten uh, on, on, on human and, and animals. So. The regulation was created to assess this risk that were linked to this situation uh, created by the technology it, itself. So the, the 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 issue now is that when you use targeted transgenesis, you lose the random insertion because you target your insertion you know exactly where you put your transgene so you can put it several times at the same place in different uh, uh, varieties and so you you, you cannot really have a, a detection methods that are completely specific and uh, or at least it's difficult to prove that it was really a transgene that was inserted there uh, and um, you also uh, so 
control a little better what you're doing, even if there's some risk assessment and it's uh, the, the object of the discussions is still uh, necessary, but uh, maybe at a level that is not as intense as for classical teogenesis, because you you, you you control better what you're doing and you can uh, target your genes in uh, regions that are uh, less rich in in, uh, in genes or, or a little more stable or more char better characterized at least it changed in changes the deal a little because uh, you know better about what you're doing and and uh, the evaluation can be simpler so these uh, new genomic techniques have been uh, classified in four groups by the Joint Research Center. Uh, they all create targeted modifications. The first two groups, uh, group one and two, uh, create stable changes in the DNA, and the, the, the last two ones uh, are create epigenetic modifications or act on the transcribed RNAs. And so, uh, so, um, in general, create non-heritable DNA changes, at least not uh, uh, on, on a long series of, of progenies. So, right now, uh, in plant breeding, the most uh, used new genomic techniques are the SDNs in group one, and in group two, uh, ODM, base editing, and prime editing. Uh, I, we're going to focus on that in the rest of, of, of the talk. I don't talk about cisgenesis and intragenesis because they are just a version of the classical transgenesis using uh, genetic elements belonging to the species in question. So as a reminder, uh, ODM is for oligonucleotide directed mutagenesis. As it is indicated in the in the name, I mean, it creates punctual mutations. It's just mutagenesis. It's not to introduce a transgene. So the way it works is that you introduce in the cell an oligonucleotide uh, template that contains one intended mismatch. So that's the place where you want to create the mutation. Then there is an hybridization. The DNA repair mechanisms will copy the change into the DNA. You see here the little uh, base pair that that is uh, uh, that changes color, and then the template is degraded, and the uh, the change that has been uh, created in the DNA is then copied uh, into the complementary stand, and then you you recuperate a stable mutation. So. Uh, the, the, the frequency of this type of event is pretty low, so you have to screen a lot, a lot of individuals also. But that, that uh, can be done on, on platforms, for example, the, the Kijin one uh, that patented uh, uh, technology uh, using ODM and that can pr produce uh, varieties uh, on demand. Then you have the site-directed nucleases, so you know there are four types. The mechanucleases, the zinc fingers nucleases, the talons, and the CRISPR-Cas system, which is the main one now. Uh, so they have different uh, particularities. Uh, that explains that why the CRISPR-Cas, for example, is the, the has taken the lead now in, in, in this area. Uh, it's because it's much cheaper than the others, and it's relatively easy uh, to develop that uh, in a lab. So now um, people are really using CRISPR-Cas and abandoning a little more the three others, even if there are some varieties already uh, on the market. The, the talent has a, a special place because they belong to one uh, particular uh, company that, to my knowledge, from now have not sell any licenses. So they're really trying to develop new varieties using their, their technologies. So I'm going to present that uh, in, in the rest of the of the talk, but it's it's not uh, the majority of the varieties. So with the SDNs, you create what is called a double strand break, and that's the occasion uh, either to have a repair that will create punctual mutations, that's what we call the SDN1 event, or uh, it creates the possibility to introduce a DNA template that can either be identical to the target just bearing a few mutations so basically what you do is that you modify the nature of the gene so you change the allele of the gene uh, so that's the sdn2 event and you can also just in use this double stand break to introduce a completely foreign uh, piece of dna so a real transgene uh, in the classical understanding uh, and then you have an sdn3 event 
So in the, the this last two cases, you need to have a double strand break and to provide a donor DNA at the same time. In the first case, you do not have a donor DNA. And so in the rest of the talk, we're gonna focus on this part, the SDN1 product, where uh, only punctual mutations are, are created and potentially also SDN2 um, that result in, in something where uh, you also can only see uh, a punctual mutation. To create uh, punctual mutations, you can also use uh, targeted uh, prime editing. So that's um, basically the it's, it's, it uses um, the molecule of the CRISPR uh, Cas9 system uh, that it has been deactivated, the, a dead Cas9, DCAS9, that is fused to a reverse transcriptase. Uh, that is programmed with an RNA, that is a guide RNA that will induce prime editing. So it is called the PEG RNA. And uh, so what happens is that the complex of the dead Cas9 and the PEG RNA will uh, hy uh, hybridize on the target. Then there will be just a NIC and not a double strand break. It means it's a single strand break that will allow then the uh, PEG RNA to be used uh, has a, a, a template to uh, recompose the, the section of DNA, then the original DNA sequence will be cut off and another NIC will be done on the complementary strand and the cell will repair this NIC by copying the, the, the sequence of the PEG RNA. So you introduce uh, a, a new um, uh, sequence uh, and you, so just by uh, so avoiding to have to cut completely the DNA, and uh, it is it is used to introduce just punctual mutations. Uh, the last technique that can be used to induce targeted mutation is base editing. So you also use in that case a dead Cas9 that is fused to a, a protein that is the citidine desaminase. It's a protein that is capable of modifying. Uh, one base pair uh, C into a base pair U. And uh, so this uh, mutation uh, is done at a certain place that corresponds to um, the, the size of the protein uh, fused to the dead Cas9. So you can control the place where this mutation will appear. And it is a controlled mutation because you know that you're gonna transform the C into a T because at the next DNA replication, the U will be transformed into a T. And well, so that's uh, another way of creating mutations, but in, in more restrictive way. You, you don't really choose what you, what, you, what you do. You have only one possibility. It's a C into a T at a specific place. So all these techniques are used to, to induce mutagenesis, but there is in the end several types of mutagenesis, and I tried to summarize these different types uh, for better understanding. So you have uh, in any organism spontaneous mutagenesis that is at the basis of evolution, and you're gonna create punctual mutation like that. They are random usually, even if some factors can influence uh, the appearance of this mutation in the cell, but basically they're random. Um, you also have the induced mutagenesis. You, you, there's an action of, of the, the technician in the lab. So you uh, can induce this mutation by physical or chemical treatments, and then you're gonna have random mutations, random mutagenesis. Or you can use these different techniques that I described, ODM, SDN1 and 2, and uh, prime editing and base editing. And then you do targeted mutagenesis. So it's induced, but it results in targeted mutations. And that's basically what is called gene editing. All these mutations, when you have them uh, triggered in an organism, or have the same uh, chemical nature. So it's uh, genetically indistinguishable. As a reminder, uh, induced random mutations uh, have been used for a long time in plant breeding uh, since the, the mid of the 20th century. We have more than uh, 3,200 varieties uh, created this way that are listed in the FAO database and it concerns more than 200 species. It's either using the physical or the chemical uh, treatments um, so it was uh, used to improve varieties for about 70 years. And uh, with the dynamic of uh, 
um, the, the, the relationships between the different companies, the fusions, the acquisitions, etc. It, it is so very difficult now to uh, fully trace what varieties can contain a mutation that had been created in a previous uh, variety uh, using uh, induced random uh, mutagenesis. So we have some varieties that are still used and, and known, and they, they, you see the date for, for uh, a while. So like a sunflower with high oleic content, grapefruit with red flesh, the self-compatible cherry tree was created this way also. And you have all kinds of other examples that I didn't illustrate here, but in rapeseed, in tomato, barley, apple, ornamentals a lot, and then all kinds of, of species that are listed here. So that's something that has been used extensively and for a long time. How these new genomic editing techniques are used in plant innovation, what is on the market really? So we start to see edited varieties on the world market. Uh, in the last 20 years, in many parts of the world, there are some uh, work that have been uh, performed uh, and things are starting to happen. I'm gonna illustrate that in the following slides. Um, we, we expect even more applications, of course, in, in the coming years. And uh, there was a rough estimate that was made by the commission. Uh, there, there's um, applications that are ready to reach the market in five years because they are in a pre-commercial stage. So a number of applications, not too many, but, but some are ready. And then in the future, by 2030, uh, they estimated that at least a hundred of new plant varieties could, could reach the, the market. I added also just an indication that um, animals can also uh, be produced and will reach the market. And in the medical sector, uh, they, they are already starting the clinical uh, tests and they, they, we have already some feedback on, on patients that have been treated for blood disease and eye diseases using the gene editing. So the, the large majority uh, of uh, these uh, varieties uh, or are still developed outside the EU, uh, be, so principally by the United States and, and China, particularly when you look at the varieties that are really at the stage that is close to the market. In the European Union, it seems that Germany and France are the most active uh, in the agricultural sector. If we look at the patterns involving the CRISPR-Cas system, we can also detect uh, some interesting trends. So uh, for now, it was uh, in, in 2019, so it must have evolved uh, already, but uh, so there was a, um, a study that was published and that showed that about 15% of the patterns involving the CRISPR-Cas system uh, were on plants, whereas 27 was for medical. The rest is just uh, the development of new approaches, new technologies, but not uh, with direct applications declared in, in the claims. Um, the main actor in medicines are uh, the US and, and China, but, uh, uh, but so Ch China is not far from the United States. Uh, on the opposite, in agriculture, China is really ahead of everybody. They, 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 they represent a large proportion of all these patents on, on plants that have uh, been uh, submitted. So what is really on the market? Uh, there is an, some ODM varieties in flax and uh, oil seed ripe, um, basically to, to, to resist to uh, herbicides and cybers that commercialized uh, them. Um, so talents, I was talking about this um, specific case that is controlled for now by only one uh, company that is called Calixt, and uh, so that derived from Selectis, uh, which, which was a startup from the Pasteur Institute. So uh, Calixt is now based in, in uh, America, and they put on the market a few years ago uh, a soybean with a reduced uh, trans fat, high oleic uh, acid and uh, low linoleic acid contents. Uh, for potato, it's a potato that is uh, reduced uh, in acrylamide uh, when frying after it has been stored in, in the fridge. Um, so it's in development in, in the US, but so they're really close to, to uh, uh, signing the contracts with um, uh, cooperatives of, of farmers. 
uh, so it's it's um, it's just a matter of commercializing it properly now. And they still have also uh, in the pipelines a wheat with uh, gluten uh, with less gluten and a, a canola with also uh, a high lake uh, acid content, but that's not not out yet. Uh, what is out uh, concerning the CRISPR-Cas system is a tomato. You must have heard about this uh, relaxing tomato <laughs> uh, produced by Japan. And so it's the first edited variety authorized in, in, in Japan. It has uh, five times the normal amount of GABA uh, that has a major role in neurotransmission. So it relieves stress and lower the, the blood pressure. There is also, uh, there was an, an announcement a while ago on a mushroom that was edited uh, to not brown over time uh, due to uh, the mutation in the polyphenol oxidase gene. And so that was developed by the Pennsylvania State University, but uh, it was never put on the market. It was more uh, um, a theoretical question that was asked to the USDA uh, who answered that it would not be uh, regulated because it had no real impact on the environment and on the pathogens. So. Um, in the future, we have plant varieties in pre-commercial stage that will arrive. So at least 15 plant applications uh, have been identified by the commission. Uh, some correspond to plant trait combinations that are already known. Uh, for example, for maize, soybean, rice, and potato, you can find herbicide tolerance, fungal resistance, um, modified oil of starch and also non browning properties. And others have not been reported before, like for example, a uh, herbicide tolerant uh, pigeon peas and flax, and uh, pennycress and camelina with modified uh, oil content. So these applications are potentially in pre commercial stage. There's uh, other applications that are in advanced or early RD stage. And uh, so it concerns a few hundred uh, cases. With a diversity of traits that are targeted, disease resistances, uh, abiotic stress tolerance to drought or salinity and heat, and also modified compositions uh, for starch, oil, nutrition profile, and uh, toxins, allergens, etc., and gluten also. Uh, and also uh, has a trait, a higher and more stable uh, yield in terms of plant production or uh, in the size of fruits and grains uh, has an impact. Uh, in, um, finally, on the yield, so all kinds of things are, are um, stewing, and then we have also um, a list of um, species on which uh, breeders declare that they were working, um, that are in a very early R and D uh, uh, commercial stage. Um, so th th they're listed here with the the, the the different species. So some of them are more advanced, so it's a little more difficult to, to have uh, clear uh, information regarding this ones, but we know things are going on uh, on them. Uh, regarding the status of these uh, gene editing techniques that are obviously uh, uh, in the hands of the breeders and, and uh, the varieties are close to, to appear, uh, it's really urgent to, to, to decide uh, what to do with that and, and how to support in, innovation. So as a reminder, this map uh, gives uh, um, an overview of the different status of edited plates in, in the world. You see that uh, in Europe, we have uh, regulated the, the genome edited crops as I'm gonna illustrate it now. Uh, New Zealand also ha has uh, decided to regulate. And for um, some countries in, in yellow, it's in discussion. And for the countries in green, uh, it's not directly regulated based on, on the technology, but based on the traits. And uh, it's a case by case approach. Um, so, what is really so what says the legal framework uh the, the current one on gene um, editing in in uh, the eu the problem is that there was no clear answer of the on the status of ngt and and especially was uh, not clear how to define the mutagenesis that was so far uh, exempted so the, the question was is targeted mutagenesis so gene editing considered as a gmo or not and some countries like France went even further, putting in doubt the status of random mutagenesis. Is random mutagenesis 
producing GMOs requiring risk assessment. Um, so I'm sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch because there's really a lot of noise to put my headset on and continue like this. So. Okay, so um, a, a little uh, explanation on what happened uh, in France uh, regarding mutagenesis because it triggered what happened at the European level. So um, when the, the directive 2001-18 was transposed into the, the French law in the Code de l'Environnement, uh, there's an article that stated that mutagenesis was exempted. But uh, at the end of 2014, there are nine associations that are listed here on the side that sent a letter to the prime minister that at the time was Manuel Valls requesting the repeal of this article because it exempted herbicide tolerant varieties uh, from, from the regulation on GMOs and a moratorium on this herbicide tolerant varieties, the HDV. So uh, the administration didn't react and so this silence gave rise to an implicit decision of rejection and the associations decided to lodge an appeal before the French Council of State, the Conseil d'État, and uh, in October 2016 the Conseil d'État asked uh, the Court of Justice of the European Union for a preliminary ruling to base its conclusion. So then it switched to the European level uh, and as Monsey explained in the introduction in July 2018 the ruling uh, considered that uh, the organisms obtained by mutagenesis were GMOs and were in principle subject to the obligation laid in the 2001-18 directive. However, organisms obtained by mutagenesis techniques, which have conventionally been used in a number of applications and have a long safety record, would be ex exempted uh, from those obligations on the understanding that in compliance with the EU law, the member states were free to subject uh, these uh, plans to the obligations laid down by the directive or to other obligations. So a legitimate interpretation of that was to consider that the GMO directive is applicable to targeted mutagenesis that have emerged since its adoption, but not to random mutagenesis who had a long safety record, as has illustrated uh, pre previously. So uh, the edited varieties uh, can be included in the common catalog, provided that they comply with the GMO directive, meaning that they have to go through the procedure of risk assessment that I described at, at the start of the talk. Uh, so what it says for uh, the commercialization that has to go through a, a listing, and also for the protection for plant variety rights, is that if you're a GMO and you apply for listing of protection, you have to provide the Part B release content and, and you have to go uh, through this very heavy regulatory dossier. And it has a big impact on, uh, on what you do because uh, well, you, you may not get enough return on investment to compensate for these expenses. If we go back to France, uh, in February, 2020, Based on the ruling of the Court of Justice, the Conseil d'État judged that uh, in vitro random mutagenesis and genome editing, so targeted mutagenesis, did not have a long safety record. And uh, for them, they considered that this in vitro random mutagenesis had appeared or had been mainly developed after the adoption of the Directive 2001-18 which can be really debated. Huh? Um, so basically all organisms produced by these techniques are GMOs. And so uh, all the varieties produced using these techniques uh, and we did not went through risk assessment should be removed from the French list and consequently from the common catalog. And the Conseil d'Etat gave six months at the time to the go French government to modify this article uh, of the environment code and nine months to list the varieties to be removed from the common catalog. So that put um, the, government, the French government in a very awkward position, you're gonna see. Uh, so 
first the government prepared because the Conseil d'État is the higher authority in France. So they had to comply. They prepared a draft decree and two orders, des arrêtés, uh, one giving the list of varieties to remove from the common catalog, uh, which were uh, 96 herbicide, uh, herbicide tolerant rapeseed varieties marketed under the name uh, Clearfield. So they reduced the number of varieties to this list in relation to the request from the nine uh, initial uh, uh, organizations that had complained. Uh, but if they really want, wanted to uh, clean completely uh, the, the French list, huh, they would have needed to list much more than that because I showed you there were many, many species concerned. So if published, because it was a draft, huh, uh, if published, the decree will prohibit to cultivate or sell these varieties in France. And so in May 2020, the, the government notified the commission and proposed a draft decree and the list. And the problem is that uh, it was a very fast reaction from the commission in August 2020 that declared that this decree did not comply with the union law. And uh, the commission warned about the consequences of one, having different status for the same variety in different member states, with the impact you can imagine on the free movement of goods and uh, an unequal, unequal conditions for breeders and farmers. And second, on the fact of removing varieties not considered in France as GMO not complying with, with the, the law and uh, ban all varieties produced by random mutagenesis on the French territory. So uh, banning random mutagenesis, <laughs> all that had an enormous, um, could have an enormous impact on breeders, on the situation in general, including on organic agriculture because sometimes uh, some varieties uh, old varieties have been produced uh, including in their selection scheme uh, random mutagenesis. so uh, they also noticed that the distinction between in vivo and in vitro mutagenesis uh, was not supported by the ruling and the eu regulation it was an interpretation of the conseil d'etat the french conseil d'etat there is also some uh, reactions from other countries that disagreed with the French interpretation from uh, the Czech uh, Republic, Italy, Spain, Netherlands, Sweden, and Denmark, and also some observations coming from Finland and Austria. So the commission informed the French government that adopting the decree uh, without taking into consideration the objections uh, would constitute a violation of the union law and could lead to engage a procedure according to the article 258 of the treaty on the functioning of the eu so that was it's a very serious situation the, the french government is facing a big dilemma because there are three possibilities either they publish the decree because their conseil d'etat is imposing it they don't modify it and then they take the risk that the commission will send the case to uh, the court of justice or they modify the decree but then they do not respect the judgment of their own Council of State. So for now, it's a lose lose situation. So we are uh, in a status of uh, immobilization, and uh, this question has not been uh, solved. So they published some decrees to modify the Code de l'Environnement, but only to facilitate uh, the, the risk assessment and, and modify, for example, the authorities involved. Uh, but they, they didn't treat the, 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 the question uh, raised by the Conseil d'État. So that made a wave huh, in the Union, European Union that came to the, the ears of the Conseil of the, of the EU. And uh, in the light of uh, this ruling and of this situation with France, it appeared really necessary to do something about uh, new genomic techniques. So in May 2019, the Netherlands and Estonia uh, led a coalition of 14 member states that I'll mention here. Uh, calling on the next European Commission to update the GMO laws for a unified approach. And this uh, discussion point was added by the Dutch delegation to the meeting of uh, the EU agricultural ministers in May uh, 2019, so really immediately. Uh, in July, the president of the Council of the EU, uh, so it was Finland at the time, proposed to the member states to mandate the Commission for a survey on the status of, of the new, new genomic techniques. 
And so this uh, decision uh, said that uh, a study um, uh, regarding the status uh, of the novel genomic techniques under the new union law was uh, necessary, taking into account the state of the art knowledge and the different views of the EU countries and of the stakeholders. And the scope of this study uh, had to include the use of entities in different organisms for agri-food, industrial, and pharmaceutical applications. And the Council also asked the Commission to submit, based on this study, a proposal, if appropriate, or otherwise, at least to inform on all the measures required as a follow-up to, to the study. So it was really to launch a dynamic on, on the topic and to get information and to start to reflect on what was possible to do. So um, the study was composed initially uh, by two online questionnaires that could be accessible on EU survey. Uh, there was one questionnaire for the member states and one questionnaire for the stakeholders. The member states, uh, so they were uh, all um, represented by national uh, GMO competent authorities that had the right also to involve or to, to consult other national uh, authorities when necessary. They all replied except Cyprus. And for the stakeholder consultation, um, it, there was 107 uh, uh, entities that, that were invited to participate. So they were composed by the members and observers of all the DG Santé advisory group, uh, the stakeholders from the pharmaceutical, cosmetic, and environmental sectors, and plus a, a few spontaneous expression of interest from different parties. Um, they all received the questionnaire, 71 confirmed their interest, but only 58 replied, but it was enough to uh, prepare uh, some conclusions. And they were published, uh, as Monte said, and she, she started to summarize. I'm going to be uh, a little faster here. But uh, so the, the main uh, conclusions were that uh, the new genome techniques do not present more risk than other breeding techniques, uh, especially EFSA did not identify new hazards uh, linked to the technique SDN1, 2, and ODN. Uh, in comparison with the conventional breeding techniques uh, and some other established genomic techniques. Um, they, they stated that plant products had similar risk profiles, uh, whether uh, they are obtained with conventional breeding or targeted mutagenesis or even cisgenesis. They also concluded something about the off-target mutations because that was that's a big concern usually in the discussions. Uh, this off-target mutations uh, potentially induced by the, the SDNs are of the same type and fewer than those in conventional breeding, including spontaneous mutations, and also those produced by the other random mutagenesis techniques, whether physical or chemical. And uh, so the the SAM. Uh, uh, and the GRC uh, made the same uh, observations. So that was a reassurement uh, on the level of risk. Another uh, conclusion was that entities are continuously evolving. So how to adapt uh, a, a regulation to a moving target. Uh, this triggers the question of the necessity maybe to uh, reorient uh, the regulations towards a focus on products and traits instead of techniques. So that's a big step to make, but so that can that can be uh, discussed in 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 the different uh, um, initiatives. Uh, there's also, uh, of course, a direct impact on different things. First is research. Maybe there's a considerable interest for these genomic techniques, but uh, the regulation, uh, of course, has a negative impact on the investment. It has also an impact on the, the commercial exchanges. Uh, because it can lead to trade limitations, disruptions, even puts EU operators at a competitive disadvantage. Uh, we have the problem of the absence of real boy detection methods because we lose the signature uh, with the targeted introduction of transgenes. Um, and also, I mean, there's a risk that all these regulatory barriers could affect small and medium-sized uh, enterprise and small-scale operators that are seeking to gain market access with these new techniques. Um, there's also a problem in the implementation of the regulation, the application of the GMO regulation. 
there's only a limited number of member states that have adapted their inspection systems for, for full enforcement of the GMO uh, legislation in respect of uh, new genomic techniques, mainly due to the lack of efficient detection methods, because uh, if you don't have a way to detect uh, randomly what you, what you have in products, I mean, you, you have to develop traceability systems are extremely heavy. Um, there's also uh, the, the, the situation can trigger potential implications for legal liability. There's a risk of fraud and, and also uh, an impact on the consumer trust in, in the food uh, and feed chains. So the conclusion of the study uh, were that NGT products have the potential to contribute to the European Green Deal and the Farm to Fork strategy. That was also summarized by, by Monse. Uh, but that any further policy action should aim at enabling NGT products to contribute to sustainability, of course. There are limitations to the capacity of the legislation to keep pace with the scientific developments. It's going too fast. Uh, that cause implementation challenges and legal uncertainties. So the applicable legislation is not fit for purpose for some uh, new genomic techniques and their products. And uh, because of that, it needs to be adapted to scientific and technological progress. Uh, so one of the main arguments was that it was not justified uh, to apply different levels of regulatory oversight to similar products with similar level of risk, uh, as it is the case um, when you compare plant conventionally bred and obtained from certain entities because the mutations, the nature of the mutations uh, is exactly similar. So there is a need for a legislation that is resilient, future-proof, and uniformly applied. And that uh, uh, brings me to the last part of the talk, which is the, the prospects for this future-proof legal framework. Uh, the different steps that the Commission have initiated uh, are first to engage a wide-ranging communication effort to share the results of the study and to discuss its outcome and the next step with the EU institutions and the stakeholders uh, in specific meetings. And there was only uh, already one in November 2021. There was a high level event uh, at the EU Parliament that was extremely interesting with uh, speakers and contributors uh, of very high uh, quality and, and expertise. Uh, the second uh, type of uh, uh, step that the Commission made is to initiate a policy action on plants produced by targeted mutagenesis and they included also cisgenesis because the products are, are similar. Um, this policy action, of course, as usually has to be based on an impact assessment that starts also uh, as usually with a public consultation. So there was four weeks of consultation until October 2021 uh, on the Commission part will have your say. And uh, they uh, gathered more than 70,000 contributions coming from 91 countries, uh, including 27 member states and 64 non-EU countries that had their word to say because what's happening in Europe is impacting them also. Uh, so you can see here the proportion and mainly citizens, and then you have a different uh, type of actors. Uh, NGOs only 5%. So, just has a, a little summary of the topics that was discussed by the respondent. It, it's, it's the first, uh, so the older the, the answers are being uh, analyzed uh, 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 these days by the, by the commission, but they, they started to give some information on, on the type of answers that they, they received. So uh, basically it, they, they talk about risk assessment, sustainability, trustability, information to the consumer, liability, cost of contamination, intellectual property, etc. So regarding the risk assessment, there are all kinds of positions that can be doing nothing, being even stricter, proportionate the risk assessment. Uh, well, people are, are pretty, uh, have pretty diverse opinions. Um, the sustainability should be addressed horizontally and not by sector, which is a, a, an interesting idea. Uh, the traceability, uh, the detection problems are recognized that, that some uh, want a specific detection method to be still asked for. And so uh, to, to solve this issue, there's a, a call that was launched by the Commission uh, in the framework of uh, Horizon Europe. So there, there will be even more information produced on this topic. Um, then the question of informing the consumers is uh, what type of information should be shared? Uh, but always uh, keeping in mind the importance of respecting consumers' rights. 
uh, uh, the, the liability is driven uh, is a driver of acceptance of rejection also. Um, and regarding the, the intellectual uh, property issues, um, it's, uh, it's discussed in the framework of the biotech directive. And there's also some questions regarding the organic sector. Uh, the, so it's, I think it goes through different uh, topics. So all this issue will be discussed in the, the coming months. And if we look at the timeline that was set by the commission, uh, we are just out of this uh, step, the open public consultation. It will be uh, complemented by the creation of some work groups to get more information on specific issues like on sustainability. And the objective is uh, to be done with the impact assessment and to prepare a position, if possible, for the second quarter of 2023. So things are moving and uh, there's still a lot to do, but it's, it's progressing uh, in the right sense, I, I, I say. Thank you for your attention and I'm open to the questions with Monse. Thank you very, very much, uh, Cecile. Very interesting presentation. Now I'm going to, to get back control of the screen because I'm going to show you already some questions that have come in. The first one, which is uh, statistically the one that happens every time is when we will receive today's lights and recording. <clears throat> uh, we will provide them to you uh, this afternoon uh, or tomorrow morning at the latest. We're just going to cut the slide, put together the PDF and then uh, send it to you then as soon as possible. I would have then leave to you the second question. That was a very interesting presentation. The um, a sentence, uh, 100 new plant varieties could be on the market by 2030. Uh, could you share perhaps uh, the source of this number is asking Isabella. Perhaps, uh -huh. um, uh, Cecile, no problem. Okay. we yeah. can also put it in a follow-up email if you want to send it to me or if you have already so, uh, available. Simply, yeah, I can say it's it's the, the commission study on NGTs. And I, I indicated in the in the slides the, the 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 website where you can find it. So there is more details uh, on this uh, piece of information. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, then the next next question: Is it true that the EU regulations regulate GMO species produced in the EU, but do not regulate importing of GMO species product from other countries? From Chris. Paula is asking this question. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I go ahead, Monte. Okay, uh, you can compliment uh, if you. Uh, so no, no, no. Uh, we we regulate everything. So it means that if you didn't get an authorization uh, to commercialize your GMO wherever it comes from uh, in in the in the, the European Union, you cannot put it on the market. So it means that you you reject rejected by default. <laughs> You, you have to get an authorization. So we regulate basically everything because uh, uh, by default, if you don't have your authorization, you're not, you, you're not uh, allowed to exist in the EU market. Yes, indeed, I can only confirm this. I mean, otherwise it would make no sense if we would just uh, uh, allow, uh, so these GMO species from other countries or uh, products from other countries. So yes, I... I confirm what Cecil said. Thank you. And the next question is by Christophe that says, what does it mean sustainability has to be addressed horizontally and not by sector? So that's a, that's a tough question because it's just a feedback from some observations made during the, the consultation, the public consultation. Uh, so the commission is processing the answers and will provide a report uh, on, on this. So we'll have more information. But uh, so what I can imagine is that uh, they, they want to have a transversal approach of sustainability uh, through all sectors, meaning uh, um, uh, so uh, the, 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 the different parts of the market that can have relationship with each other and they can use the products prepared by uh, a previous one in the chain. 
So it's just to have a global understanding of sustainability from the source to the final, final use. But so I, I have no more information on that. Um, so I think this fifth question is pretty much, sorry, pretty much connects to what you have uh, been saying right now, Monsera, because uh, Emerson's asking, do we do mm -hmm. we yet have an idea on whether the Commission will propose a legislation that is project-based rather than process-based? Yeah, I, I think that the question, the point here is that we don't even know if if this is going to happen. I think that's what Cecil was saying, but you can of course confirm is that that would me, be maybe a solution to solve uh, the issue, so that that not to focus so much on the techniques, but rather on the products. But this process-based uh, approach, in fact, has been confirmed by the Court of Justice ruling, so that so that we have to see whether the Commission, based on on this on this uh, consultation that is going on, the study and so on, if they will make uh, this uh, change, if they will propose this change, uh, that as Cecil said, it has its advantages. But we, we don't know for sure if this is going to happen. So, but I don't know, Cecil, if you want to, to complement. No, I think you've summarized it perfectly well. It's a, so it, it, it would be a solution, but it's very complex to, to develop. <laughs> and uh, so it, it has to be debated still. Yeah, no, we cannot really know in advance. I think question six also turning around this. Mm -hmm. point some working groups will be created during the eu impact assessment q2 2022 do you have any idea which working groups and who would be invited perhaps we can direct this question to the uh to the to the uh, impact assessment itself but if you'd like to answer please uh, if you if you're informed okay. about this no 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 so it's a very good question to ask to, to the Commission because yeah. uh, so they have to be transparent. They're going to announce them at some point and it's going to be published. But for now, they're just thinking. I think they want to have uh, analyzed all the information that they received to identify if there are some specific points that should be discussed further. And uh, so we can, uh, for now, we don't know. All right. Um, so I think it's connected to an example. You, it has been done before. What are farmers currently in France doing? Are they sowing Clairefield varieties? So, uh, frankly, I don't know. This is so. If they if they do the the so the it, it it's it's I I don't think it's it's something that they do anymore but because it's really not viewed positively because it creates all kinds of problems and uh, for themselves and and they all tend to uh, uh, towards using less and less uh, in trends and, and pesticides and, and and herbicides so I, I I don't have any uh, real figures on that and that that's a good question that could be asked to um, farmers the of, of agriculture. No, no, yeah, yes. or cooperatives, or yeah. Uh, so the situation is really untenable. I mean, the people they do not know what to do. So. Yeah. yeah, I see. And then we can go on with question eight. How could imported genome edited plant variety regulated in the EU when no information about the pro the production process is made available by the developer? Impossible to determine if the variety have been technically modified yes yes so it, it, it's uh yeah. it, it's it's absolutely the heart of the the problem we are in a position where anything can happen because we have no way of controlling anything no, no way of of uh, implementing the regulation so for yeah, now they, yeah. they go through yeah. Yeah, and if I may add, even for us at the CPVO, when, when we received a, a, an application, it, it is up to the to the applicant, for example, to say if it was a GMO, if they used the GMO. So it's we, we rely on the information that we receive. So if we don't receive uh, information on that, we cannot know. <laughs> yeah. So this is really, I, I agree, this is one of the biggest issues with 
with this uh, genome edited plant varieties. I agree. And questions are um, at the moment over. It's just a comment from Petra that says there was um, perhaps a little misleading to say that only 5% of the contribution um, to the inception impact assessment came from NGO. In fact, 99% of the individual contribution were coming from NGO campaigns. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So officially, 5%, but then individually, everybody had the right to express themselves. <laughs> Rightfully. So probably much yes. more. Yes, yes, yes. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Um, let me see. So <clears throat> it's 12.04. Thank you. Uh, we are very much in time. Um, and uh, I think it was a very interesting session. Also, questions that have been asked prove that. Uh, um, everyone who has uh, been at the webinar and also stay with us at the end of the uh, until the end of the session and uh, um, so uh, thank you to those of you and all of you who had the patience of, of uh, connecting waiting also five minutes more at the beginning of the webinar and coming actually until uh, the end <clears throat> for me it's been a pleasure to have the chance to hear Cecile and uh, Mons that so I'd like to thank you both uh, very very much for your time of course which is our most precious thing we have at this word uh, and uh, also uh, of course for your clarity in the presentation thank, thank you very you. much thank you for the invitation <laughs> so it was a pleasure indeed ah, but see you see you soon now I should say <laughs> then <laughs> We're gonna we're gonna meet once again. Perhaps uh, we can see uh, when uh, we're going to be together for the next time. Given that I have the all right, um, uh, it's going to be on the twenty first of uh, June. There we're going to be once again uh, connected with the uh, CPVO. I'm going to be uh, there again. Uh, so I wish you all a uh, lovely day then. You will receive the slides as a presentation as I have mentioned. By the way, Cecile and Montserrat, you cannot see it, but all participants are thanking you very much and um, congratulating you for the presentation on uh, the question and answer part of the screen, which I can see as well. I'm just referring this to you. Just Thank you very much. Today. Thank you. And uh, with this, I would close the transmission and uh, I uh, would then give you appointment for those of you who are interested in the topic on to the 21st of uh, June at 10.30 once again. Thank you very much and uh, have a very, very nice day. Thank you, thank you. Goodbye all. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thanks.